So when most people think about the heart, uh, we have a tendency to attach emotions to it. Love, hate, happiness, sadness, joy, or jealousy. Or maybe you just had your heart broken at some point in time in your life. Which makes me think about Valentine's Day, which was about two weeks ago. And it was kind of hard to avoid seeing heart-shaped everything. You had heart-shaped candy, heart-shaped chocolate, uh, heart-shaped balloons and cards. Or even like a teddy bear holding a heart that has like this nice little saying on it about how much I love you or what you mean to me. And it's just funny because it's just a, a person's way of trying to tell you what I'm feeling uh, and that what, what's in my heart. And in my profession, even though we seem to humanize the heart with all these emotions and, and feelings, uh, we actually just take your heart out and give you a fake one. <laughs> and, and for me, myself, that's kind of weird because I'm like you. I think, oh, the heart, emotions, feelings, all of this. Yet, you know, we just take it out, throw it in a bucket and give you this fake one. So I have to ask certain questions like, you know, what does that mean? And I remember the first artificial heart patient I got to work with, uh, I asked them all the silly, dumb questions that anyone may ask. Uh, do you still love your wife? Do you love your kids? Are you angry? Can you get angry? Am I making you angry now? Uh, if I scared you, would your heart rate pick up? Even though I know it can't because I control it. Uh, but I gotta ask because I don't know what that's like. And, and the only way I can find out is talking to this person as to why would you even put yourself through something like this? So I'm gonna ask you to think or uh, imagine you're in your hospital room and the doctor comes in and tells you, uh, you're gonna die today. And there's really not much we can do, not in a year, not in six months, but actually today. You know, what goes through your mind? Do you start thinking about all the things you're gonna miss out on, like your kid's graduation or they're growing up? Are you gonna miss out on the child's first steps? Are you gonna miss like a loved one's wedding? Or maybe you're just thinking about, man, I really wish I told that person how much I really liked them. Uh, or maybe you start thinking about other things like, man, what's gonna to happen to all my stuff? <laughs> or, you know, my family's not financially prepared for me not being here anymore. These are real things that patients have actually shared with me when a doctor, you know, presented this to them. And so it made me start to wonder, how much time would you need at that point? What would you start thinking about? Man, I just really wish I had like another day or a week, or man, I just need a good solid 10 years. You know, how much time would you need so that you would be comfortable or feel like you can pass away in peace? Or if it's a loved one, what would that feel like? You know, hoping that you just had a little bit more time with them so that whenever they are gone, you're gonna be okay with that. This is a reality for people or for many people that uh, have severe heart disease and are actually waiting a heart transplant. And these people are, are kind of deemed the sickest of the sick. You know, medications are no longer working for them. There's no other type of mechanical device that can actually uh, give them the time that they need to get this transplant. Because even though you need a heart transplant, you have to wait for that donor heart. And the problem with waiting for a donor heart is we're gonna keep coming back to that special word, time. And, and that's just something that you're out of at this point. Enter Syncardia's total artificial heart. It's kind of like a superhero. It comes in to save the day. And it's a really special device and it's unique because it gives you the time that's necessary for you to wait for that donor heart, one. And then it also allows you the opportunity to prepare yourself to receive that transplanted heart. Because uh, the surgeries are, are pretty extensive and very tough on the body. Uh, what's really special, especially considering where we're talking about this device, it's actually made here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's the only FDA approved total artificial heart in the country that, that can be used. And it's made right here in good old Tucson. I could care less if you clap or not. I don't make it. I'm just saying. Uh, anyway. So, but what do we have here is we have a pneumatically driven device. All that means is that air pumps the, pumps the device. Uh, you have one of two choices, a 70cc or 270cc or 250cc biocompatible polyurethane uh, ventricles. There's four mechanical valves and 
in the heart. It's connected to two air hoses, which we call drive lines, which will be connected to some form of a driver. Right now, we're in the portable version, but we also have an in-house version uh, that's a little bit bigger. The only thing that goes through these hoses is air. That's it. So don't think blood happens to leak, leave the heart or anything. Uh, and, and that's all it takes. I mean, you know, as far as like the device is concerned. Now, when we go for implant, you know, I think that's relatively easy too, if that's uh, believable. Uh, so as we go inside your chest. We've removed the left and right ventricles. We attach what's left of your atria to our device. We take two cannulas and attach to your pulmonary artery and your aorta. We close your chest. Exiting out the left side of the body will be your two air hoses. And again, it's going to be connected to one of two devices. Usually in the beginning, you will be connected to a bigger device. Now, once you're actually on the device, you know, you, you, you have to kind of go back to like what really gets somebody to this point. And I go back and I think about this one young, young lady who, what, since she was born, she had heart problems her entire life. And, you know, she was just so sick that she was unable to play outside, have friends. Uh, she was unable to go to school ever. And just, she just acquired, you know, racked up a, a lot of hospital bills. So much so that her father actually had to take three jobs and he was just never home to pay for these bills. And you gotta understand, like, this is daddy's little girl. She's like the cutest thing on the planet. It's two long pigtails, these big brown eyes. And whenever she hit you with her soft voice, you're gonna do whatever she wants. And that's just all there was to it. Uh, so she got progressively more sick. And by the age of 12, she ends up in Tucson, Arizona. And this is where the doctors have to come and tell her, uh, you're out of time. You need a transplant right now. Unfortunately, there is no donor available. However, we do have this device. It's called a total artificial heart. We can implant that, and what it will do is it will give you time to wait for that donor heart. So she gets the device, and the most amazing thing happens uh, for this girl who's really been sick so long that you know, getting up, walking to the kitchen was just a chore for her. All of a sudden, she just comes to life because kids are resilient. You get the blood flowing. I mean, it's just amazing just to like see her eyes light up and now she's smiling and laughing and playing with her little brother and her parents are just like, man, she's just, you know, she's never been like this in her life. Uh, we got to, you know, have barbecues outside. We got to like watch late night movies. And this was all around October. So of course, Halloween comes around and we get to take her trick or treating throughout the hospital which is something she's never done. Because walking to the front door, let alone down the block, to beg for candy just wasn't possible for her. Uh, she dressed up as a princess, and she really, truly was, you know, like this artificial heart princess. It was, like, adorable. And just to see the look on her parents' faces with their joy as well, just to get to see their little girl who's been sick her whole life finally healthy. Uh, she ends up getting a heart transplant. And the hospital is just beaming. Everyone's so excited because we all adopted this girl. You know, normally we work with adults. So when we get a kid, we're just really excited. It's like, oh, this is just the greatest thing ever. And we're just, you know, thinking about all the things she's going to get to do and just so fired up for her. And then a week or so later, she died. And I remember walking on to the unit. And as soon as the door opened, I, you didn't even have to tell me. I just felt the wave of emotion. People from the doctors, the nurses, the PCTs, I mean, we're just, we're just crushed. And I see the mom, and I give her a hug, and I'm just upset, and I just start apologizing, telling her, I don't know what we could have done. I am so sorry. Uh, we, we, I wish we could have just figured this out. We, I just feel like we failed you. And she stepped back and looked at me like I was crazy. She was just kind of like, what are you talking about? She said, during the time she was on the device, she was healthier than she's ever been in her life. She's never felt so good. They had so much fun as a, actual, as a family. Her father was there every single day. The person that she actually craved to be with more than anyone, because like I said, she was daddy's little girl. And that was just tough just to, to, to know that this 12-year-old little girl passed away. But what really saved me personally was just hearing the mom tell us about how awesome it was as a family when she was actually on this device. So when we go back to that question about how much time would you need knowing that you're going to die that day, for this family it was a month. And they were very grateful for that. Uh, 
I think about another friend of mine who was actually on this device. And I say friend because if you're a patient in the hospital with me, you got two weeks to be a patient. After that, we're just friends, and so all the rules are just going to change. <laughs> and so my friend, uh, his story goes, as a youngster, he was highly active and, and pretty athletic and loved baseball. He's really good at baseball and had aspirations of playing in the major leagues. Uh, but life is a funny way of changing things up. And he got really sick, which ultimately, you know, destroyed his heart. Now, at this teenage age, you know, all this takes place. He starts thinking differently, unlike other people, where he's not really able to envision a future further than 30, which to me is a bit of a trip because I couldn't imagine being 16 or 17 thinking that I'm not going to live past 30. Maybe I won't get married or have kids. So this is his reality. Now, of course, he ends up getting married to a wonderful woman and, and they have children. But un unfortunately, he's getting progressively sicker. And it just gets to a point where the doctors tell him, you know what, someday you're going to need a heart transplant. And like, OK, so they, he does all the things that you're supposed to do with meds and this or that, uh, waiting for your transplant. Uh, but it never comes. And he just gets worse. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona, uh, where we love when, if you're really sick, come here. And so he gets to the hospital, and the doctor walks in and says, you know, uh, it's really bad. You need a transplant now. Again, you understand, like, this is, this, is a, this is a husband and a father, and they're telling him, like, this is it. You know, if you don't do something now, you're, you're going to die. And so he's hopeful. He's like, oh, well, maybe if, if the heart transplant is going to come, so let's not necessarily rush the surgery for a total artificial heart. Uh, but as life would have it, decisions are made for him. And we end up in surgery, and we implant this device. Now, coming into this surgery, he was pretty decompensated, pretty sick. So once we get him upstairs, it's pretty scary. Uh, at this point, we're really kind of rushing around, trying to figure out what's going on. Like, why isn't this just kicking right in for him? And, you know, and I believe there's a lot of factors that go into play, especially having such a serious surgery and you're, and you're already sick. And on top of that, his lovely wife happens to be up in the room. And you meet her, you're just like, that is just the nicest, sweetest person in the world. So I can't have her upset or crying because I don't want to be responsible for that. So I'm thinking, dude, you, you better live. <laughs> Not that I'm worried about you per se, I just can't be responsible for her upset. <laughs> So it works out. You know, he comes through. We start working with him. He starts rehabbing. He's getting stronger. He graduates from our bigger device to this Freedom Portable uh, device. Ends up getting to go home to spend time with his kids while he's waiting for a transplant. And overall, this is about a year and some change that he's actually on this device. Uh, he's doing things that he couldn't do before the device. You see him doing pull-ups, he's hiking with his children. I'm not saying he's like rock climbing or anything like that, but you know, he's doing things that he couldn't do before. And on top of that, he is the only person to ever do the Pat Tillman 4.2 race without a heart. Yeah. That's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> so next time you want to stay on your couch, think about this guy. <laughs> so he comes back, he gets his heart gets a transplant, and the interesting thing was is from all the training we've done and working with him, his response after surgery with the heart transplant was night and day compared to what it was like when he had the total artificial heart. And so he recovers, everything's going well, and you know, as soon as he gets out the hospital, he's already making hunting plans and all this other kinds of stuff. I mean, just ready to live life. And what's really interesting and, and kind of cool, at least for me, is he's actually in the audience right now. He and his wife are both here right now and, what makes that so special is because i know because of the device that i'm holding in my hand right now is why he's here you take away this device he's not here hearing me speak right now that blows my mind because i love this guy <laughs> i think his wife's cooler but i love this guy <laughs> and uh when I go back to time, from his perspective as a teenager, thinking that he's not going to live to 30, but now with this new lease on life, he's thinking 30 more years, 40 more years. I got you know, see my kids graduate, all these types of things. That that that's pretty cool because now he's got more time. 
Now I know this is about home is where the heart is. And as corny as this is going to sound, for me personally, home is where the artificial heart is. <laughs> because it's made in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Oh.